This is DIA Connections. You're taught in survival school, never, never, never refuse food, because you can eat or you can die. Whether it's the diplomatic relations, whether it's technical collection, human collection, analytic work, we build on the history of what we've done in the past to always focus on making sure that everyone is accounted for. The ability to close out a situation so that family members know um, what happened to their loved ones uh, is, is something that, that's real important to me and many others in DEI. It's really hard to talk about closure when there's so many sort of conflicting feelings um, that, that arise upon the news and the return of those remains. None of these men have been forgotten. We've got a case file on every one of these men that's unaccounted for. They're not forgotten. And we're gonna do everything we can to bring them back home. Powerful remarks from a variety of voices about the efforts, sacrifices, and commitment to bringing home prisoners of war and missing in action from the Vietnam War. This is DIA Connections. I'm really glad you found your way to DIA Connections. Our podcast series is all about taking a look behind the curtain at some of the ways the Defense Intelligence Agency impacts our lives, both past and present. We look at stories and topics that are connected to DIA. Sometimes these connections are tangential, but sometimes they're very direct. In this episode, we'll be discussing the vital role the DIA plays in the POW MIA mission. It's an aspect of the Defense Intelligence Agency that doesn't receive a lot of notoriety. We today have concluded an agreement to end the war and bring peace with honor in Vietnam and in Southeast Asia. All Americans held prisoners of war throughout Indochina will be released. There will be the fullest possible accounting for all of those who are missing in action. President Nixon's speech to the nation after signing the Paris Peace Accords, occurred in 1973. But the fate of many of those missing in action at that time has remained unknown to this day. In this episode, we speak with a DIA analyst who participated in recovery missions, the author of a book about families reunited with remains of lost loved ones, and a representative of a U.S. government agency that investigates missing personnel in Southeast Asia. And you'll get to hear a very special conversation with a former prisoner of war in Vietnam. He's a remarkable man, and it's a remarkable story. But first, let's get a foundation for understanding the Defense Intelligence Agency's role in the POW MIA mission. From DIA's chief historian, Greg Elder. Establishing the status of a missing person um, is an extremely complicated and and difficult task. Um, They're often lost over enemy territory. The adversaries are often not apt to tell us the status of the person. In fact, in many cases, uh, a foreign adversary may want us to believe that the person is actually alive because it provides them leverage against us to to tell us um, that they can bargain, that they come to the table and bargain. And so we aren't always getting accurate information from the people who are holding our prisoners or, or a determination on whether or not they are actually missing. Then the sources themselves coming out of foreign countries, for instance, uh, are not always reliable. So a, a, a refugee from a foreign country uh, trying to make their way into our country may use uh, the fact that they've seen a missing person as, as a leverage point to be able to get into our country. Um, but that may be based on absolutely nothing other than they're having read a newspaper account of a U.S. missing person. And so the, the establishment of the status of, of Americans uh, overseas who are missing or prisoners of war is an extremely complicated endeavor. Greg went on to describe the reasoning and circumstances of DIA's involvement. Prior to 1967, the POW MIA intelligence mission was effectively carried out by the services themselves. In the Vietnam War, the Defense Intelligence Agency began without having any formal role or mission with POW MIA. However, as more and more pilots began getting shot down, and as we put boots on the ground, it became clear that there needed to be a central organization within the Department of Defense to oversee the mission. By the end of the Vietnam War, there were 2,583 unaccounted for American prisoners, missing or killed in action, or body not recovered. The search is an exhaustive one, and something experienced on a first-hand basis by our next guest, Mary Quinn. 
1993, Mary was a Defense Intelligence Agency analyst with the Vietnam Section of the Special Office of POW MIA Affairs. What we worked on and what I was an analyst for were what were described as the priority discrepancy last known alive cases. And those had been selected by General Vesey, who had been the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And the criteria for being one of those cases was either an American who had been in captivity and did not come home, so that we, those were the died in captivity, and others were missing in action cases where the service member was down. Um, a lot of this, a lot of them were pilots, but there were some other folks that were um, down on the ground um, in communications with Americans, and then. Uh, and in proximity to enemy forces. And so we never heard about them. So they used the criteria that the Vietnamese could be reasonably expected to have some knowledge about their status. And there were about 375 cases of, that fell into that category. Often, one of the most formidable parts of the job was simply dealing with the terrain in that part of the world. Because we were looking at a bunch of the lost locations in um, Quezon, so it was where the Marines and had been encamped, so trying to get to those locations on hilltops. And we would drive as far as we could drive and then did our walks. It was very interesting, and I, was, and I just kept thinking, what a terrible place to have a war, just because it's a, it's a beautiful country, but the accessibility with the hills and the karst and um, some of the challenges were if um, aircraft crashes would go into hillsides, so we needed to go up to the hillside, and that was, it was not easy, and that was one of the, a couple of the guys who had been on my team who were from the Joint Task Force Full Accounting, um, they were subsequently killed in a crash with their Vietnamese teammates um, trying to get to one of those crash sites on a mountain and the helicopter uh, crashed. And so it was dangerous getting there. And then the other issue that was dangerous was the unexploded ordnance for where these aircraft had uh crashed or they had been locations for bases. Um, I had another case that it was pretty easily located along the highway, the main highway that goes up the coast, um, and it had been a, a Marine corporal when he had been on the phone saying, I'm coming in, I'm coming back to base, and then he never appeared. And we went to the exact loss location, and it was a small hill no vegetation on it at all, which stood out in Vietnam. And it was because this particular hill had been so bombed by both sides. So much ordnance was there that it would destroy his remains and would also endanger anybody that was trying to do the recovery. So the best we could do for his case was to talk to people who remembered seeing him and saying that they had buried him at the time at this location. It was too dangerous for everybody involved, and we would have destroyed his remains in trying to recover them. As you'll hear throughout this show, the word success when referring to search missions takes on many forms. For Mary, she recalled one instance in particular that stood out. One of the early successes was when we were on the investigation in 93, there was a an Air Force pilot who was one of our priority discrepancy cases. And we had some disagreement with the Vietnamese about where we were gonna go and do the investigation. And we diplomatically persisted. And when we went to the location where we had determined through a number of investigations where he was likely to be and interviewing witnesses, we found him buried in a makeshift coffin, but he was, he was buried intact, flight suit, ID card, dog tags. And to be able to do that for a family was hugely important. Mary Quinn's career at the Defense Intelligence Agency has spanned decades. And she credits her work early on as an analyst for POW MIA Affairs as the driving force behind her passion for the mission to bring them home. One of the reasons that I chose to have a long career at DIA was the very personal commitment that my colleagues and I feel towards supporting uh, service members. And part of that 
was formed when I was working in the POW MIA cell, seeing the great efforts and the, the seriousness of purpose that people had in terms of, we have a commitment to these are our brothers and sisters, and we need to do everything that we can to account for them. And I think that that is, it's committed to excellence in defense of the nation, but it is really committed to one another and committed to service and taking care of one another. And, and that uh, was a driving passion for me. And it was one of the things why I was happy to be able to use my experience in the cases from the Vietnam War up to current activities. And I think that, that that's something which I've seen in all of my colleagues that work on these related issues. We write no last chapters. We close no books. We put away no final memories until your questions are answered. Your husbands, fathers and sons and brothers did their duty by this nation and this nation will do its duty by them. That, of course, was President Reagan speaking at a POW-MIA Recognition Day ceremony in 1984. POW-MIA activists played a role in pushing the U.S. government to improve its efforts in resolving the fates of these missing service members. Progress in doing so was slow until the mid-1980s, when relations between the U.S. and Vietnam began to improve, and more cooperative efforts were undertaken. Even Hollywood began to take notice. Popular action films like Uncommon Valor, Missing in Action, and Rambo First Blood 2 increased awareness to the cause. And in 1986, DIA established a program called Stony Beach. The program still exists today. Through it, DIA has individuals that conduct analysis and work as liaisons in several countries to continue support for the many missing people who are still unaccounted for. We're going to hear more about Stony Beach in a little bit from our next guest. None of these men have been forgotten. We've got a case file on every one of these men that's unaccounted for. They're not forgotten. And we're going to do everything we can to bring them back home. That's Johnny Webb. He's the Deputy Director for Outreach and Communications for the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, the DPAA. When American personnel remain captive, missing, or otherwise unaccounted for, the Department of Defense Accounting Community becomes the responsible agent for determining their fate and, where possible, recovering and identifying the remains. Mr. Webb was gracious enough to spend some time with another one of our DIA historians and a voice you'll hear from often on our podcast, Paul Isaacson. Mr. Johnny Webb, my pleasure to be with you. It's uh, Thank you for making the time. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you as well. Thank you. Let's just jump right in and, and um, get to the heart of what you do. How would you describe the DPAA to someone who has never heard of the organization? So if we go back starting at World War II and look at the number of Americans who have not returned home from the battle, the wars that they were fighting, they're still on the battlefield somewhere in a foreign land, or they've been recovered and are buried as an unknown in one of our national cemeteries. And so our mission is to do the research, analysis, to locate those individuals, and then put forth the effort uh, to either disinter the unknown or put investigation teams on the ground uh, globally to search for that lost site, to search for that individual or individuals lost in that uh, incident, recover those their remains, bring them back to our laboratories, uh, either in Hawaii or in, in Nebraska, and identify them and return them to their families. How do you work with the Defense Intelligence Agency in support of, of achieving this fullest possible accounting? And DIA is a, is a vital uh, partner to us, uh, especially in the Vietnam War. Stony Beach provides a lot of different information. Uh, every time they go out and provide interview individuals, they will provide that in a report. And in some cases, they will actually find an individual that has human remains or they find a location where human remains have, have been buried. And so they will actually be involved in at least getting 
you know, the portion of those remains of the individual has them to send them back to our laboratory so that we can test to determine if indeed they are an American individual. And if so, then we can follow up with a full recovery team to recover that location. Let's move on to the field work. I'm, I'm fascinated to find out more about how you actually do this in the field. Let's start by by talking about where are these specific location that the work actually takes place, and how do you how do you find these places? How do you become aware of these places that you need to go to? Uh, we're basically two primary categories: uh, investigation teams and recovery teams. Uh, talking about the investigation teams, those personnel. Uh, speak and read the language of the country that they're operating in. So if they need to go into the archives, they can go into the archives, uh, pull out information. They can also speak to locals and question locals about any information they have about the loss. And so they do a very good job of that. Johnny, um, how many people are on these teams and, and are they volunteers or are they, who, who are they? Our recovery teams they're larger because they're primarily going to go to one site and excavate that site. And those are about 10 to 14 uh, team members. Uh, again, most military, except for the civilian scientists. But in order to aid in an excavation, especially of a large aircraft, uh, we may hire as many as 100 local workers to support the teams to move a lot of the soil that they're excavating from the site. One thing that's important for people to understand about this whole mission that you're describing is you're, 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 you're not flying to Kansas City and checking into a hotel for a conference. I mean, you're going to Laos, you're going to Cambodia, you're going to Vietnam. How does it work? How does it work getting a whole team over there logistics wise, you know, permission, access? How does that all come together? You're right. It is a very complex, complicated process to move the team into the country, along with all the equipment that they need to do the work. Now, we're fortunate enough that uh, in most locations, uh, we fly a military aircraft uh, at least into the airport. And then from there, uh, for, the, for the Vietnam War, uh, we have vehicles staged in all three countries so that when our teams get there, they can either drive to the site, if it's possible to drive there, if not, then we must depend on the host nation uh, providing helicopter support to get us into those sites, uh, get our teams in there with all the equipment so they can set up a base camp where they will stay at a base camp for the entire duration of the mission. Uh, how, how long are they typically on a site? How much time? So typical time on a site is 30 days, uh, can run up to 45 days. I will tell you though, however, Many of the crash sites that we deal with are so large that it takes multiple uh, excavations to recover that site. So a team could go back to that same site two or three times to ensure they've completed the excavation and, and be sure there's not any more evidence that's being found as they're excavating around that site. And when, so when you say a crash site, I'm assuming you're talking about like an aircraft, right? And if it could have gone down over a mile of distance, right? Well, that's correct. You take an F-4 that's going in, and if it doesn't go in at a very steep angle, uh, it can it can cover a large area. And of course, one that uh, actually maybe hits the top of one mountain and, and bounces off that and then scatters over to another mountain down in the valley. So they can be very, very large uh, crash sites. And of course, most of it's in the jungle, so all the vegetation has got to be cleared so that they actually see what they're doing. So it is a, a very labor-intensive uh, process. So what kinds of things do you find in the dirt and what's considered, what's considered a success? I will tell you that many people would say, well, unless you find the individual, that's not a success. Uh, we, on the other hand, say, we excavate an area, if we don't find the individual, but we know we're in the right area, that's still a success. Uh, we may have to go back, but we've also done some work. We can share with the families the work that has been done, keep them fully informed as to what's going on. Now, 
our our goal, our hope is that we're going to find human remains that we can bring back and identify. However, I will tell you, uh, for the Vietnam War, uh, there's some real challenges. And the challenges are primarily the soil in Vietnam is very, very acidic. And so when you've got uh, an individual that went down in, in an aircraft crash, and of course there's a lot of trauma to the body, so a lot of bones are going to be broken, uh, which results in uh, more exposure to the acidic soil. And so they're getting eroded away uh, by the soil. So in some cases, we've only been able to find the teeth. Tell, tell us about that vital role of forensics in this mission. Every few years, is there something really big that happens that just makes your mission so much more doable? Absolutely. We've had a lot of breakthroughs, uh, scientific breakthroughs over the years. The most recent that we have is a technique called stable isotope testing, where we can actually take uh, a sample from a bone or a tooth, do the testing, and determine uh, the general area in the world where that individual was raised or, or grew up. So that's a big advantage for us that we do not have to do DNA testing on every individual with the stable isotope. It'll, it'll allow us to segregate those individuals because if you look at the diets uh, in the United States, basically you have a, a corn diet uh, versus a diet of someone that grew up in Asia, which is a rice diet. And so we can make differentiation between those two by doing the stable isotope testing. Wow, that's, that's incredible. I understand that you are a Vietnam veteran. And based on that, can you talk a little bit about what this mission means to you in a very personal way? It's very important to me as a Vietnam veteran uh, to be able to return those men who gave their lives for this country back to their homeland and back to their family. And I think that's part of, you know, for those of us that have worn the uniform, that's part of our creed, to leave no man behind. I tell people all the time, had I not come back home, I would hope that somebody would be doing this work to provide answers to my family who live with the uncertainty, not kning what happened to that loved one that they put on a plane and sent off to war to never come back home. And so to me, that gets very personal uh, and seeing the families and and the sacrifice the families have made with the loss of that loved one, um, it, it, it really resonates with me in a very personal way. Truly heartfelt sentiments from Johnny Webb. He also told us that he led the first recovery team in Vietnam back in 1985. Thanks, Johnny, for the impact you've made. The work performed by the DPAA and the DIA provides hope and sometimes disappointment. It can also bring finality to a mystery that's gone on for decades. After a short break, our next conversation addresses that emotional tug of war. This is DIA Connections. Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, transnational terrorism. Do you know the threats? For more than 50 years, DIA officers have delivered defense intelligence expertise for our nation's leaders and warfighters. In the tradition of DIA's unclassified Soviet military power series, we bring you a new set of products that examines the greatest threats facing the U.S. today. Earlier this year, we released China Military Power. Now, Iran Military Power examines the core capabilities of Iran's military. Iran has expanded its capabilities and roles as both an unconventional and conventional threat in the Middle East. This report provides details on Iran's defense and military goals, strategy, plans, and intentions. Learn what DI's top intelligence experts have concluded about these complex threats and their potential impact on the United States and its allies. 
These assessments add an important viewpoint to the public conversation. Join us online. This is DIA Connections. Welcome back to our podcast on bringing them home. Sarah E. Wagner is an associate professor of anthropology at George Washington University. She is also an author, and her most recent book is titled What Remains? Bringing America's Missing Home from the Vietnam War. In her book, Wagner tells the stories of America's missing service members and the families and scientists that continue the search for them. We begin by getting a better understanding of Wagner's motivation for writing the book, which began years earlier and more than 2,300 miles to the east. I'm a social anthropologist, and the first part of my career, I spent um, researching the identification of missing persons in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So basically, I was looking at this post-conflict society that had um, thousands of people whose bodies, the remains, hadn't been recovered during or immediately after the war. Um, and in particular, I was looking at um, an event that took place in July 1995. It's, it's known as the Srebrenica genocide. And you had about 8,000 victims. These were men and boys, um, Bosnian Muslims, who had been executed um, en masse. Um, they ended up being, most of them, their bodies were dumped into mass graves. And it meant that a lot of the bodies um, ended up being jumbled together and remains were commingled. And this was an extraordinary challenge for the forensic scientists, the forensic personnel trying to recover and identify remains. For Wagner, the application of forensics technology in the Bosnian genocide became the catalyst for researching MIAs from the Vietnam War. So to fully appreciate the enormous efforts involved, she participated in an excavation recovery mission in Vietnam, similar to the ones we discussed earlier with the DPAA's Johnny Webb. It was an extraordinary process. I just hadn't understood uh, the challenges, the operational, the physical the sort of the, the resource challenges that are involved in a recovery mission. And, and in that way, to see it and partake in it firsthand um, really opened up and it opened my eye, eyes to, you know, this, the enormous efforts and expertise that go into um, recovering even one tiny bit of bone. By day nine, we ended up recovering and, and locating um, one tooth. And it was a pretty extraordinary event because you're, you're sort of scratching the surface of this jungle floor um, and you're working day after day and you have no idea. You're getting scraps of the helicopter, but you don't quite know if you're in the right spot. And then, you know, in these screens, right, a quarter inch mesh um, screens that are set up and you're sifting soil and you're chucking um, bits of, of rock and, and sticks and so on. And then lo and behold, there's a tooth and you know that you found someone. I wanted to follow the story of this recovered tooth um, back to the family. That tooth was returned to the laboratory in Hawaii. And within a few months, they were able to determine identification. This tooth had been positively identified as belonging to Lance Corporal um, Merlin Ray Allen. Allen had come from um, this little town in northern Wisconsin. Um, and so I, I, I went out to northern Wisconsin and I had a chance to meet with some of the siblings, um, had a chance to talk with veterans, including um, people who, you know, who knew Merlin Allen, um, neighbors and classmates and things like that. And one of the things that I think that this, this um, the advances in forensic science have enabled is, um, you know, there's an American promise to repatriate, right, to bring back remains. But there's also a tradition of seeking to identify them individually. And forensic science, as it's in its you know, really cutting edge form in this day and age, allows that second part, right? It allows for even one tiny bit of bone, um, if the conditions are, are uh, enable it, to identify those and to send them back. One tooth or three teeth or, you know, what, what almost seems like a, you know, a, a sliver of bone. And that individuated, that individualized identification does new and powerful work. Um, and what I mean by that is it allows 
um, a family to sort of reconvene and a community to gather to celebrate the homecoming of that identified uh, service member. As of January 2020, the Department of Defense lists 1,587 Americans as missing and unaccounted for, 90% of them in Vietnam or in areas of Cambodia and Laos where Vietnamese operated during the war. What that means in real terms is that many families are still left wondering. When a person is missing in the context of war, it is what Pauline Boss has described so aptly as an ambiguous loss, right? There's all kinds of uncertainty around that person's fate, around that person's remains. What actually made it clearer to me is that ambiguous loss, when it is stretched over decades, um, makes it that much more powerful and in some ways challenging and difficult and painful when remains are returned. Wagner's project spanned 10 years, and during that time, she came away with a deeper understanding of what the DPAA is trying to do and what we here at DIA have been doing for decades, and that's bringing our fallen service members home. Home isn't always geographically specific to you know where the person was born or even where the family still lives. Um, often home is, you know, in this much bigger picture, it's repatriation to the U.S., right? I mean, that's one of the fundamental ideals about how the United States cares for its missing service members, its missing or dead, is to bring them back to U.S. soil. The story of Lance Corporal Allen is about he was, you know, he was unrecognized um, somewhere on this mountain slope, um, in central Vietnam. So place was really important and place was incredibly, home was incredibly and very specifically defined for the family. But it was also that act of bringing him in back into the fold of their care that I define as home. Our attention has been focused on the search, recovery and repatriation of those missing in action from the Vietnam War. But now we're going to talk about the prisoner of war aspect of DIA's mission. If you're familiar with the POW MIA flag, you know it consists of a silhouette of a prisoner of war before a guard tower and barbed wire in white on a black field. I mention this because whenever I see that flag, I think of our next guest, former prisoner of war and retired Colonel Henry Fowler. On Easter Sunday in 1967, Colonel Fowler was flying his F-4 aircraft in support of a strike mission over Hanoi when his aircraft was struck by surface-to-air missiles. He ejected and was captured by enemy forces 10 minutes after parachuting to the ground. He was taken to the infamous prison camp called Hanoi Hilton, where he remained in captivity for more than six years. As we've discussed, the Defense Intelligence Agency became the central organization within the Department of Defense to oversee the POW MIA mission, gathering the information needed for locating and rescuing those held in prison camps throughout North Vietnam became a priority, especially as we became aware of the treatment or should I say mistreatment, of the prisoners. In a few minutes, I'll describe DIA's efforts to rescue Colonel Fowler. But first, I want you to listen to how he described what his typical day in captivity was like. And remember, his typical day lasted more than six years. First of all, you're in a cell that's a solid concrete room, either does not have a window or a window boarded up, measures maybe seven feet, nine feet by 10 feet high, 25 watt bulb hung from the ceiling and burned 24 hours a day. Uh, Never saw a toilet, never saw a bed. We slept wood or cement, never saw shoes. Uh, We're given Ho Chi Minh slippers, which are old tire treads or straps. And we never saw hot water for six years. Uh, We did get a mosquito net which covers above, around, and under where you sleep. <clears throat> Extremely important in that part of the world because you would have never gotten any rest without it. A straw mat to put between us on that on which we slept. Uh, of course, two pair of pajamas. Toilet paper that resembled some kind of sandpaper, I think, from somewhere. We got a dishcloth that was called our bath towel. I think I had two in six years. And we got a very small bar of pure lye soap once every 60 days that you could use on anything you wanted, but you better make it last 60 days. Uh, Daily life often started about 5.30 in the morning, beating on a gong. Uh, We exercised, I say we, each person was by himself, uh, and we culminate an exercise period by running a mile in place. 
since in the seven by nine room you can't run very far. Uh, if there was any cold polluted water, we were allowed a short cold water bath that's out of a huge concrete tub with a homemade bucket. Uh, about 15 minutes, we spent 23 hours and 45 minutes in that cell with nothing to do. Got two meals a day, and they consisted of a bowl of watery soup, really c colored water, and stale unsalted loaf of bread. I, I think my roommate thought I was near 80 pounds by the end of 1967. Uh, if we ever got meat, it was just a sliver, but that meat was often either rat, cat, dog, water buffalo, horse meat, monkey, fish heads, which were often rotten, chicken heads, which were often rotten. But uh, if I may, you know, 23rd Psalm says the Lord prepares the table for you, doesn't say what's on it. You're taught in survival school, never, never, never refuse food, because you can eat or you can die. As if surviving the dietary conditions and the physical torture weren't enough, the mental aspect proved just as challenging for Colonel Fowler. Uh, mental was very difficult. You tend to live in fantasy. Faith in your country and in your supreme being and in your fellow prisoners all work to keep your mind up. And that, of course, flows into, into spiritual. Now, North Vietnam is a atheistic country. And I once had a guard that caught me praying, and he didn't do anything about it, but he did say, me okay, Vietnam no. Me is Vietnamese for America. So I learned that. But on Sunday, you know, we were in three different buildings. They had a minimum crew of guards on, and the guard can't be everywhere at one time. So they often left a space at the bottom of our doors. So the guy at the end of the hall would watch, and when the guard went to the next building, he would give two thumps, and would all stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance and the Lord's Prayer. And then when he came in, they'd give one thump, and we'd all sit back down on our bunks. Uh, and to me, that was a very important part. Maybe I didn't have as much when I went in, but this old saying, there's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. And that's really about all you had to hold on to during that time. An event occurred in 1970 that had a profound impact on not only Colonel Fowler's mental well-being, but on many other prisoners as well. The Defense Intelligence Agency provided information to U.S. government officials about a prison camp called Sante which was in a village in North Vietnam by the same name. With DIA support, a raid to rescue the prisoners was carried out. But when the helicopters landed in the camp, they found it empty. Sometime earlier, the prisoners had been moved to another location. But during that daring attempt, a noisy diversion was created a few miles away. And although it wasn't the intent, that noise provided encouragement for any prisoners who heard it. Guns were off, bombs were being dropped, and airplanes were being flown. Things that we hadn't heard in a long time. It gave us a terrific morale boost to know they cared because we felt the government had not forgotten us and were doing their best to get us out. Colonel Fowler was able to survive for another three years after the Sante raid before he was finally able to go home. Uh, February 18th, 73, and was released, and I keep a picture of that. I call it Release from Hell, and I go back to Dante's Inferno, which was published in 1400 A.D., and he painted a picture of what he thought hell was like in isolation, solitary, extreme temperatures, uh, cruel treatment, uh, thirst and hunger. <laughs> that was Hanoi. Did go out to get on the C-141 and uh, took off 30 minutes into the flight. Uh, aircraft commanders came on the intercom and said, gentlemen, we've just crossed the shores of North Vietnam. Welcome to freedom. Colonel Henry Fowler spent 2,147 days in captivity. His military decorations include two silver stars, two legions of merit, a bronze star with valor, and two purple hearts. But his story didn't end there. He received a law degree from Stanford University in 1978 and went on to serve as a staff judge advocate in various positions and locations before retirement in 1991. You can't help but be inspired by how he not only survived and endured as a prisoner of war, but emerged from that experience even stronger. I hope you enjoyed listening to our episode, Bringing Them Home. Because if you did, I have a feeling you'll appreciate part two. It's the story of Jessica Buchanan. She was a humanitarian aid worker kidnapped by Somalian land pirates, held hostage for 93 days in the desert, and rescued by SEAL Team 6. It's a riveting story that the DIA was very much a part of. If you wish to learn more about the Defense Intelligence Agency, and I hope you do, please find us on our social media sites, as well as DIA.mil. 
Thanks for listening to DIA Connections.